This audio is sponsored by Smoke Signals, 255 Highway 49, Tiny the Naga, Mohawk Territory. You're listening to Real People's Media. If you don't know who we are, you will soon. Where I was born, down on Fifth Line, past Cuba Lomos, you know, I was born into a family that I didn't really know at the time, that they were part of the Masonic order, and they were like the Orange Hall. And uh, my grandfather was one of the first ones, my father's father on my dad's side, he was one of the first bank counselors that were in, involved with all this stuff. So going along the way, my father became a bank counselor, and I didn't know all this stuff. I didn't know that politically, they were going against everything that my mother belonged to, which was Goya Nishra and Angona, the Great Peace. The same with her mother and the mother before her. So it, it was like, a, I guess it was kind of an ideal situation because it, I was able to look at both sides. And when I was uh, when I was being raised, see, uh, the way I look at when they raise your name in a longhouse, just like you're being condoled. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. This is very special. It's a very, it's one of the biggest events in our life. Earth and going on to get that, that special name. And uh, at that time, I was, my name was raised in under the handsome Lake Longhouse, Lower Kyuga Longhouse, and uh, I didn't know. So I tripped along. And we grew up on a, uh, not, not on a farm at first, but my father eventually, we, I was about seven, I guess, when we started farming. Nine years old, I was plopped on a tractor. That's where I stayed for until I was 16, 17. Uh, politically, I, 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 I didn't understand, I guess, what I was living through because like to have the chance to live on a farm and grow your, grow your own food and to eat your own food and to have your own livestock. Life stock, not livestock. So I look at it as being your life stock. And as I grew up, I was just telling my, my daughter in law this morning, I, said, I started lifting weights when I was seven. Not weights, just bars in the garage. And then we had a, me and my brother Cleveland, Kong Yudiko, he's passed on last two, almost year and a half ago now. So that's where we started our, because we were smaller, but we were raised on a farm. We were like little spring girls, and everybody would be picking on us, but we always walked away. They were always on their back, on their back. And we didn't look for fights. They, they were bullies and they picked on us. So we, we just decided not, not to take it, fight back. Nowadays, they got all these damn stuff and they tell those kids not to fight back. And that just gives the bully more more power. So that, that political order, like you're talking about the uh, the Orange Order and the Masons, can you talk a bit more about that? Well, basically, I, I didn't really find out about that till later on in life, but I know there was a time when that building got burnt, because it was right across from Ayala Thomas, there was a little building there. And apparently that's where all those guys down down below met, because they had already put their teeth inside of that. So the, the men at that time, I know at Lower Kiki Longhouse, uh, the chiefs were banned from there. They couldn't have no chiefs in there. I do eat a medicine society that was banned from there. I remember because when I was older, well, my brother, he, he sat in the council for a while, even Kong Yudikwe, because he was a, uh, see, politically, they split our family up when we came up here because they were supposed to be four wolf titles when we came from Onondaga. There's only one down here. And uh, we have to find out where, and exactly, I think there's a lot of people that have to do that because even with my dad's side, when my grandmother, my great grandmother, she was the last condole beaver clan mother for the underdog nation. When my grandmother Elizabeth come down, she got hooked up with Mike, who was a mason, who was part of the Orange Order, and part of the Longhouse down in the Wokyuga. They said, okay, now we're going to adopt you into the wolf clan to get her out of that beaver clan, because she was great law. When she came down here, they just kind of erased her whole memory of that. Oh, she knew, but she would never ever tell anybody. So they made her a wolf clan, so that's where her whole family sat in Lower Kiko Longhouse. They're not a wolf clan, they're a beaver clan. Because my mom and her mom and her mom before her are all both, so that would have been incest in the way we have to. So it took me quite a while to find out about that, but in the end, uh, I guess I should go back to the time when my mother, I must have been about 10, me and my brother, she said, I'm taking this home. I thought, where we live was home. But she meant the Longhouse, which to me, after all these years, is just a dwelling. It's not a religion. It's a dwelling. Religion is Kaihuyo. 
and that's basically what they, the people have to understand. That there's been a lot of mistruths and a lot of uh, true memory that's been hidden from us. Same way like when I had the one I found out that my father wasn't a wolf clan. That made me so happy because then I was pure on a dog. Because he was on a dog, on a dog a beaver. My mom was on a dog a wolf. So in both of those families, there was a, like, I don't like to say title, but they had the responsibility of holding a chief and a clan mother. Same with my, same with, uh, my other side, my mom's side. So like, as, as I gradually grew older, and through the help of my brother, we, we traveled a lot. We found out a lot of information. We couldn't find out nothing here because it's, like it's just like a perfect vacuum, you know, where they hide everything from you. Yet there's a great big wealth of information that would get us out of this, all this stuff that we're going through right now. You know? I find it interesting yeah. what you're saying about the Orange Order, because from what I understand from the Canadian side of history, mm -hmm. the the Orange Order were, I guess, descendants originally of the of English Protestants that went to <sighs> colonize Ireland, and Ireland was the first nation that England colonized. They did that after their uh, after their revolution in the 1600s, mm -hmm. Oliver Cromwell, and they they went over and they they. They kind of established their colonial system, and it was with that. That's where the Orange Order, as mm -hmm. Protestants mm -hmm. in a Catholic country, was, uh, you know, where that was held. And then when they came to North America, the Orange Order, as Protestants, were. I mean, they were very, they're very racist towards Native people, but they had a special hatred for Catholics and mm -hmm. for French Canadians, and they were also involved in. Um, like the guy Thomas Scott, I think it was that Louis Riel um, mm -hmm. killed uh, after he after a trial for insight, basically for trying to go against the the Métis and Indigenous uh, rebellion that where they were mm -hmm. establishing their own province. That was all Orange Order. That it, it was like Orange Order fighting against them there and um, being very actively involved in the colonization. So what I, what I would what I would ask. The Protestants, were they more or less down on the state side? And that was a big fight between... Well, they were more on the English side in terms of like the... It like being the, or the Dutch and the English mm -hmm. breaking from the Catholic Church. But I mean, still essentially carrying on the, the same institutions or very similar institutions or religion doing similar mm -hmm. things. But I guess... I guess it was more to do with uh, Protestant working better... Protestantism working better with... Uh, capitalism and Catholicism working better with a feudal system mm -hmm. that, that explains part of it. I, I mean, it's. I just find it interesting that that um, that there was an Orange Order that that uh, Ongohoni people were a part of, and that was. You know, Tom, and, as far as I know, that's the only one that was down here. Uh huh. I don't know about the other end. They, they might have, because I think as, as I grew older, I seen a difference where there was never no difference between the owners and. Uh, the what you call the uh, Mohawk workers. Their, their intent was to get rid of the Confederacy Council. But they got to realize too, the Confederacy Council is under us, the Onjoko and Hasta. You have a, like say what, I don't want to even touch that, but you have mm -hmm. a council that sits over the four fires. You got the Chief's Council, the Clan Mother's Council, you got the Women's Council and the Men's Council. On top of that sits one, General Council, which is the Ojoko and Hasta, the people. But see, all that stuff's been hidden from us for so long, you know, and when we, when we went back to, uh, my mother took us, she walked us across the floor, put us in a corner where the wolf sit, and that's where I still sit. And uh, I know there's, when they took us back, when her and my grandmother took us back there, they treated me and my brother different because I, I wasn't part of what my father's family did with the dehorner part and all that stuff, or with taking, you know, not allowing the chiefs to go in that building, not allowing the Hadoui to go in that building, which is one of the things that came out of my wheel, to not to let that strong medicine be part of our way of life. So I, and I, I can, like, when I was talking with my brother, we talked about things like this, and he said that he knew, he remember when uh, my uncle, great uncle, Sam Green, they used to have a smoke room in the back. After supper, they go out, etc. So him and my uncle, Bob Key, would be sitting in there. And this time, uh, Russell Johnson, he's passed on and all, but he come down and he said to, he said to Uncle Sam, he says, uh, we want you to bring the Hadoui back to lower Cuba Longhouse. And he shook his head. Because the old guys, they just come in here, put whatever they're going to talk about right away. They eat candy coat, man, this is, what, this is what we want. 
He walked up to the monk Kebab said, what are, what are we going to do? He said, you heard the man, they should have never left in the first place. Take them back. So like a lot of those people that sit down in Lower Kigalama don't know that. But that's from sitting and talking with people and listening to people because now like they've got it functioning down there again now. And they're slowly starting to understand of what we really have to go back to. And uh, like when we were down here this time, I, the Yuga Kyugas, Oneidas, the Seneca, we got a lot of Mohawks in that, in that underdog longhouse. But yet if we put our family together, we did a chronology not too long ago, about three, well, well that was during the site. There's 700 of us, what plan? Just from my mother's direct bloodline. We could fill that longhouse up just for my own family. But I don't want to do that. We have to work with what we got. And if the ones that don't really want to follow or trying to, trying to get to, get to the basis of the truth, like I like it in Nanadaga back home. The women are starting to rise, rise down or now. And I'm, I'm following them on Facebook. And I'm, 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 every time I put something on Facebook, nobody ever goes against it. Because you, how are you going to go against the truth? If the truth is the truth, you begin with the truth, you're going to end up with the truth. You start with peace, you're going to end up with peace. You start with lies, you're going to get multiple, multiple, multitude of lies till you're really so damn lost you can't even believe yourself anymore. This is the situation we're in right now. You know, in, like uh, growing up on that farm, he taught me, there's no such thing as work. It's the way of life. I didn't know when I was... Because I used to have a uh, hay fever when I was younger. I get slapped in that damn, that granary shoving and all that barley, all that dust or that weed or the oats and all that. I'd get out of my eyes or even smaller than what they are right now. So <laughs> it, was, it was like, it taught me to be resilient with the fact that it just, this has to be done no matter what. No matter what personal pain you're going through, the end result is you have to think of what the whole, like the whole, uh, like the commonwealth of the house of that farm. And that, that farm touches on other people because when we we used to have like uh, thrashing machines, my grandfather did, did. I don't know how they paid them, but those guys would come in and they'd have all kinds of Christ the table was just full of food. You know, it would be so nice to see because they were all talking on go home. They were all joking, and they'd eat and they'd let them have a half an hour after they got done eating, and they'd go back out in the field again. And it was the same way, like you know, whenever we built some, a whole bunch of guys would come over and we just work. We're not even work. I don't know what you would call it. We existed to the point where going back to the Commonwealth of all, of all the people. That's what we have lost, uh, the way I look at it. And, uh, you know, when, when all this stuff started happening all over the place, it's all politics. And it, we have to get beyond the politics and just go back to just... Because I remember this one guy, uh, Meredith Quinn, I did a documentary on him a couple of years. I think it was by 1994 or someplace in that night. Yeah, 94. And he told me, he says, when you become political, you take it aside. With the great law, he says, go in this one, go in, there's only right and wrong. You stay on that right path, he says, how can you go wrong? The trouble is now, they give it a multiple path to go on. I was kind of involved in sports quite a bit when I was younger, but seeing my brother Cleveland, he <laughs> he had flat feet, so he couldn't run. And uh, I guess we're all made different. He had a mind that was so superior to everybody else. That was his gift. And he had the gift of singing, the gift of remembering all those songs. I wish I could have had one tenth of what he had. You know, but I was gifted with something else, with the, with all that stuff. And with the, to have that kind of energy to, and to be able to spread it out. That's been my gift so far. And like, uh, I just explained to you how when I got that cancer, I went down to 100, I don't think I said 133 pounds, and that's what I was at. So I was, I shriveled up. But now I'm back to 155. I'm on my way back. I pretty much as well say I passed on because I gave away all my stuff. I was told to do that. This this is three years ago. You might as well start passing your stuff on because you're not gonna you're not gonna you're not gonna survive this. But I think I survived it and I came back in a spiritual way. So now, like I, as I stated, I have to get my ribbon shirt all made out again, and I had to get even my for my leggings down here. That's what I was, I give my son them ones, but they're too big on me. So then she made me another breech cut, and I, like I'm shaped like a V. I'm not. I'm not straight down. That's what most people are. So that my shoulders are bigger, and then the one she made me, it's a beautiful breech cut. I don't know where he's got it. I think he's upstairs. It all goes. That's my gift to him. 
for looking after me for like it's been seven months now I've been here. I didn't really want to come here because I want to try to stay on my own. But I'm telling you, the time when I got on that operation, I was, yeah. I couldn't even step upstairs, you know, and I, they took my, like eight inches out here. And that was the hardest part because <laughs> they got a washroom, there's three levels here. There's one in here, there's one in the middle, and one on top. There's a stand-up shower here. My two sons were born and determined they were going to put me in that shower. I said, it ain't going to work. I said, I can't hold my hands up, my arms up that high. I said, plus you got this bad this dressing on here yet. So then they took me up to the second one. So they, they picked me up and they set me in there. At least I could wash my lower portion to kind of just, well, you know, just the light washed on top. But it, for the first time in my life, I had to accept help. Before I was always, I'll get it done some fucking way, no matter how I know. And, but I was helpless. And the youngest guy, like Ryan, Dutch it day. He's the first, last voice I hear at night before he goes to bed. He's the first voice I hear in the morning when he gets up at four o'clock. We've got that bond between us. I told him, I said, I don't know. I said, okay, when I opted to take chemo, I said, uh, look at all this stuff. I said, are you, really, are you really, if I stay here, I get diarrhea, I get constipated, I get all that stuff, the side effects. He said, dad, you looked after me for two years. I said, I looked after you for goddamn near 40 years. <laughs> he said, no, but I said, when I was really in a bad way, he says, you, 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 you nurtured me back up. He says, I, I owe you that much. You stay here as long as you want. And I said, but I'm not comfortable. He said, Look, I don't want you to go in no other place. You have to be here. So with him and the rest of the, my family really pulled together because they, uh, they had two fundraisers. Mohawk said one fundraiser. And to me, it was like, I don't need this. But then I got thinking of all the natural past stuff that I got to buy. And, like, how that well goes. That's like 40 bucks a damn bottle. I go through two of that a week. It's because there's a lot of vitamins when you're on uh, mm -hmm. chemo that you don't get. And a lot of it's the B vitamins. That's what I got there. You talk about how your your mother brought you back mm -hmm. to the the longhouse and your, your father was a part of the, the dehorners or... Well, his, his family were. His family were. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't just my father. It was his uncles and his father. I, I met you at Gonestado mm -hmm. um, on the, the front lines of that. Uh, struggle, but I'm sure there were many other struggles that you were a part of long before that. How how would like what were your first struggles against you know this colonial system? <laughs> Locking the band council up, like it was funny because like uh, me and my dad would have disagreements about the way the band council was running stuff. One of them was the housing. I said uh, you know I said you guys are a lending institution. You got no authority on trying to get people out of there when, when they default. I said, what you should be doing is trying to help them get out of default, default not defaulting on them. That was one of them. And every time that we would have that disagreement, he would, he would see my way of how I was, how I was looking at things. Because I have to look at things the way I was raised. Because when he, when, we, when he was, like when I was younger, my other brother, my sister, he was always gone because he was always just boozing around. That's part of the, the life that, my younger brothers and sisters don't see that because he, he was abusive to my mom, and very, very abusive. And uh, we grew up through that. But when uh, politically, when you look at how even how the farm was run and everything else like that, and my grandfather being part of that political, they had a big farm. And all the ones that were involved with, uh, with all the, how to dismantle the Confederacy and how, how that was to put... It's still like that today. They put more bling bling, more shiny stuff over there so the people that are supposed to be on a path of being on go home they look over there. Because they even tell you that when they send you out with a wampum, you're not to look to the shiny stuff. Your mind is on that, those words that you're carrying within that wampum. You take that there, that's your only job. You you tell them that you're happy that you're here and the chiefs and clan mothers that are there, hopefully they're all happy and the people are good and healthy. Then you bring those words back, after you deliver them, you bring it back. You're not supposed to look either way. Right now, that's what we're doing. Cause it's like, a lot of people are looking for the money now. I mean, you need it, but how much do you really need, you know? So, when my dad would be having different, because he had bring stacks of papers from, from the council, he said, I'd read them. And I was listening to my great-grandmother, she said, well, my grandmother, she said, always follow what the creator put there for you. Don't go to a man-made thing. He says, because then you'll be okay. 
And basically, I've always just followed with the creator game. I don't even like using the creator anymore because I learned that it's a it's that energy. Creator goes back to just a singular man again. Now we're back in a religion. Mm-hmm. You know, and to me, like uh, when you talk to different people and they're how far they are and what they've learned, and like down here, it's bad because you got guys that are in there that they're preaching, they're not telling you the truth, and that's that's the biggest that's the biggest lie going around right now. That's why these young these young guys and. There's some guys that I've had, like one just passed away about five weeks ago. He died of an overdose. This young man was only 24 and he had so much. He knew a lot of the speeches. I would take him, we'd go to Oneida. He'd help look after Wicks and he'd, he'd stay right there till, we were, and then, till the burial and he'd come back with me. And we'd go back and forth all the time. We did that. And I took him, him and a group to Ogwazasti to help them with uh, midwinter. You know, it, it was so... Because all the times we asked for help from uh, Ganasarakon, which is Loran, and um, all the guys up there, they always came down. Paul, Francis, we never went that way up until that time, till that midwinter. And we went there with, with peace, we went there with a good mind, you know, and they, they've never seen a Stova Goa being sung like that or being danced like that because all the time, They've always been just defending, defending the border, defending their people. They didn't have time to sit back and teach their young guys. Because even Loran, when he announced that we were there that time, he says, we got some guys from Oshwego. They never call this place Oshwegan. They never call it Six Nation. This is Oshwego. And actually, there's a there's a word in Onondaga that this is where the head council meets. They're talking about that whole council house. That was the people's house. When they took that out of there and they put it in that longhouse, it became a religion. That in mind, in the mind of the people, that bars the Christians out of there, the way they think. And why should it be like that when we're supposed to be meeting for the betterment of all the people? It doesn't matter. Okay, so you mean the the old council house in right downtown by the yeah. by the lights? That's uh, that was that was the original people. count yeah. people's house. But see you. I was just talking about it this, this morning with Larry Green. When an Indian, Indian superintendent is sitting right there, he can put it in your mind, tweak your mind. And, this is what you're, and that's how they did it. They put it they, in the men. I, I was sitting there and I thought, it's not the women that are the weak link. It's the goddamn men. Because they got egos. Women are born carrying a life and the progenerate life. We're, we're just... What do we do? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's like uh, we sit around think who's the strongest one who can bullshit the best and stuff like that. But it doesn't get our it's we don't sperm donors. <laughs> we can't progenerate anything except bullshit right now. You know, and that's what I was telling Larry Green. I said, "You and me are the weak link. Audrey's just lost. She's got her job. She's a mother. She's a grandmother now." We're, gra- we're fathers and grandfathers, but at the same time, what are we really doing to help the cause? To get us back on, on a natural path again. But Van Council did a lot to me when we stopped that dump that time. That was one of the things we locked up. He asked me about what skirmishes or whatever. Like, my dad was in council. We slept for them locked down there. And he said, what the hell are you doing? I said, you're not listening to us. You're not listening to the people. That's our, our job, to make sure that you listen to us. We would stay on her for a while and then give us lip service and everybody's okay, we're all right now. And they take the lock off. It happened every 10 years. I was at the one in 71, 81, 91, and 2001. Right? And that's what I made up my mind. I said, look, at, we got this damn place locked up again. They got computers, they can move it around any place where they want to go. So that was the last time I decided, even after we had that, that dump issue down here, because they had, they had already made an agreement with Mel, Mel Lashman that time. I know they, they hit that way back in and nobody wants to talk about it. But it fucked me up for a while because uh, when I became the spokesperson for the Six Nation Against Pollution, which was SNAP, my grandmother, I could go sit and talk with her, tell her what they were doing wrong, and she'd gather up the older women from the sixth line and seventh line, and we go in that council, and they speak uh, mostly against Cuba. And I don't think those people understood what they were saying, but they knew they were in shit when the women came in there. And, we do, we would leave, but when they found out that it was I was the one that was taking them there all the time. But that's my job, that's my duty to, to kind of go in between and try to fix things up. That's an Onondaga. 
And then Dr. Gay got that's our job. It's our duty to do that. So then after a while I became a spokesperson, I became the troublemaker. That's when I put that under coverage, you know, my butt. And that's a long story for itself, but <laughs> it's like, uh, I never held that against them. Yeah. Van Council. I knew who the guys were that did that. I talked to them right just like we're talking right now. To me, that's a, that's a part of my life that was a stepping stone. I met a lot of good, I ended up doing jail time. I met a lot of good people. Is this, just, sorry, is this uh, out of the tobacco trade? Well, that you were talking about, or no? That was over that dump issue. Over the stopped, dump issue, yeah. you went to jail for that. Mm-hmm. Wow! Well, I went to jail over. Uh, and what year was that? Uh, I think I, I went in there '95. I was in there for four months. I was supposed to get six months. They, they were going to give me ten years. Eh? Well, oh, holy shit! What did they charge you with? I had I was in possession of an unrestricted uh, restricted weapon. But see, that goes back to when they put the undercover regime. I was entrapped in a whole bunch of stuff and. One of them was I had to get a restricted weapon. I can't mention names where mm-hmm. I went to try and get it. I didn't know nothing about guns. I was selling tobacco. I'm an iron worker. I'm a farmer. I'm a carver. I'm all that stuff, but I'm not a gun runner. I did that because this was the undercover cop wanted a restricted weapon from me to charge me, to take me down to the point. They had me charged with goddamn uh, selling dope and everything. I never ever did. I never sold that gun. That gun was even oper- it was inoperable. Never had a firing pin in it. But they still use it as evidence. Like I say, I, I didn't hold that against them. They had they were doing what they thought was right. And even the RCMP told me they said what happened to you is, has nothing to do with uh, the force. It's all political. And the guy said, "Do you understand what I'm saying?" I said, "No." He said, "Well, let's go outside." He says, "You stepped on some people's toes back home. There's some big people. They're the ones that put you on. They put." Us, we got the orders to try to get you as much shit as we could. He says, well, and we understand that. You've always said you're following your law. How the heck are we going to go against that? You are. But when I went to court for that tobacco charge, I still got a $76,000 fine for selling rollies. I was protecting GRE and all the guys that were in that. I took the butt of the bullet, $76,000. I'm still paying on that fine. And, you know, the rollies are down here. We set that up so that. All the from Agwazasti, right from the factory, right to the guy that takes it to the landing on the American side, right to the boat guy, right to the Ameri- on the Canadian side, the landing, right to the runner, right to right to Oshwego. Everybody had a chunk in it. Everybody, Commonwealth was looked after, and that come out of this brain. You know, now look at it. And when I stood in court, who the hell is paying the fine? Who, all these guys are still selling that. GRE included. They got these uh, black market factories all over the place. Yeah, you know, they can get, get get mad at me, but that's the truth. You know. You were essentially setting up a means by which Everybody. only people could move tobacco mm-hmm. from one place to mm-hmm. another, and then sharing the wealth that yep. was produced fairly amongst the people who made it. Mm-hmm. And that, and that's, a, and you feel that that's a threat to the Canadian system because it's because of what exactly? Because it's they're going to keep us down because they're going to keep us being uh, dependent on a whole society. Not that I don't, I can't call it a society. It's a mechanism that they, they put in place to pro-generate genocide, economic genocide. And right now, we placed ourselves in a economic oppression. Because, as I was telling Larry this morning, I said, it's us that, and then Audrey said, I said, you guys, you've accepted that. I can't, because my mind doesn't work like you guys. My mind, because Larry's always talking about growing and farming and all that, I, said, I grew up growing stuff. I grew up eating turnips that we grew. We had our own cucumbers. I'm not talking like a little garden. I'm talking like two or three acres, because we used to sell that stuff, take it to... Uh, which is called not Waterford, and it was a uh, cucumber factory there, and the turnips that we grew. Heck, we, we used to have bins in the basement because there was 12 of us. And that, that's how we grew up. Every time we butchered, or I, I can't say butchered, we harvested a cow. We always ended up using everything like this so with the beef tongue. That's just part of how I grew up. And I, I go down to my, my grandfather's whenever they were uh, harvesting pigs, they make blood sausage and all that stuff. Like, I would sit there and watch my aunts do that. They'd send me a bit at 11 o'clock, but I grew up watching people working with their hands so that they could feed each other. Right now, we go to, we go to Zares, we go to IGA, wherever. That's where we... <laughs> we're not who we say we are anymore, you know? I mean, it, 
it's not a sad state of affairs. We just got to realize we're the only ones that can fix it. There's not no magic wand. Not no one man that's going to change it. Not one woman. Not just the Messiah that's going to come out of here with his eagle feather. And you can burn all of the back you want. If it's not up here, and if you do not have the will, and if you if you can you can always bring it out of your mind to have that will and to change. Like I don't know how many people's lives I have, I have changed. Like with Big Joe when I first met him, he was in I didn't know. He, he was in I don't know, I don't think he get mad at me. Like he was in the crap. But as I spent more time with him, I spent more time with him. And, but, because we were at the site for a year, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, we never accepted no money. And we were there because it, I was told to stay there and protect the lines, hold the peace. It's, it was my job. And a lot of times we had to do that. Not violently or physically, we just had to talk those guys down all the time. Because uh, some of them were just not their own fault, but there was not enough uh, older men there. And it was like... The Cuba guys had some there, and I was there, and our whole family was there, like the whole wolf clan. That's how we were able to control the fire keepers. Because there was the, maybe like Sean, this beaver, he's, the hell is, you know, the eel clan, Sean, Sean Flues. <laughs> Kelly and those guys were, were beaver clan, but the bulk of that whole, the fire keepers were all wolf clan on their dog. And it's easy. You just, you have to learn how to talk with peace and how to, get them on that same level, then they're going to decide themselves. What was the impact that the that the site Ganestado had for you, and what kind of an impact did that make in your life? I think uh, I'd have to go back to when I first started. Uh, see, in my life, even when I was at home on a farm, I was 13 years old when uh, my, my father, I hadn't been plowing yet. I was disc, I was spring tooth and hair and all that stuff, but I never plowed. So there's one night, Tuesday night, he says, come on, we're going to get the tractor ready. So we went out there. <laughs> he says, put it in the gears. He put, put the, then he, he adjusted everything. He said, no, he says, shoot for that stake. He said, make it as straight as you can. So I, I got on her and I drove it. He, 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 wouldn't, he wouldn't let me drive fast. He wouldn't go, go real slow. But we did that two nights in a row or three nights in a row. And finally, Friday night, he says, get that tractor ready. we got to go way up the other end. And I, he never told me where we were going. What we, what I was going to do, you know, kept me in the dark. So I took off about 7 o'clock. He told me where to go. It was way down there, Brant County. And uh, we get up there, and my dad and my uncle were there. So they said, okay, this is our spot. And they had two stakes there, and they, they set me all up. And we're not a very big pat, like probably the width of this house, like that room right there. It's just the kitchen here. Mm-hmm. Maybe four or five, but you can only go so slow, and they can't use their hands. they got to use their feet to keep the first straight. So about finish about three o'clock, the old man says, well, he says, go back home. He says, and I hope the plow, he says, and fuel it up. So I got back home and did the chores, and I come in after. My mom says, get your best clothes. For what? He says, well, we got to go someplace tonight. What about the rest of the kids? They're staying home. you got to come with us. They didn't tell me they were going to a big dinner that they're going to give us awards to do all this stuff. So I'm sitting there, we ate. Then my mom said, you got to go up there. I said, why? Did you hear them call your name? I said, no. She was going to go up there. So I get up there. Here I got first prize. I beat the farmers I used to be, where they got the golf course on here, they were Hagen's. And they're, the one that they had for the representative was 18. And they were supposed to be the best farmers in all the Haldeman County. And I guess they used to take plowing matches all over the place. So when I went in there this time, and they said, we have to, we announced first prize. I went to Chris Sanders, <laughs> you know, and give me his plate and all that stuff. And but you didn't even know you were competing. No, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't, then I wouldn't be nervous either, too, I suppose, you know. And so then we went back, and I said, my, I asked my mom, what's this all about? And she says, you won first prize. She says, can't you, that guy is 18, and you beat him. And they're, they're supposed to be the best family. I said, supposed to be, I guess they're not. And so, you know, like, it was stuff like that that happened in my life where even like when I played sports, I used to run around that, we were at Cuba Longhouse, all the way down to Highway 6, all the way around that whole block. It used to take me 42 minutes. And I was only like, probably I was in, just going to Central School, 13 maybe. And I used to run all the way up to Shregan and I'd go 10 laps around that, around that track and I'd run home. But I, I was forced Gump a long time ago, you know. 
it was like everything that was put into my path all the time, I always tried to use it for the positive side of it. You know, and we just got done talking with Larry this morning about snow snakes. I said, well, they used to put, put that by the Cuga Longhouse where my brother's bike land. It was my dad's land at the time. But they would make a track there and they wouldn't let me and my brother come with Dick. We shoot because we were thrown farther than the men. Well, we're farmers, farmer sons. We had more, more like muscle and more, you know. So we weren't allowed to play. <laughs> so then we were just like 13 or 14, but we would stand there and we watch where those snakes would jump out. And when those guys would all leave, we go wandering over and we find more snakes. <laughs> so, you know, it's like stuff like that that happened. And like even when I started, I broke my wrist when I was a kid, about 16, 17, and I started iron working after that. And well, my dad says, I want to take you to work. I said, All right. You know, I'm going to help you once. I said, Okay. He got me my first job, but then after that, it, it was like I used the way I grew up, the way I understood life, how the political stuff, I always try to keep that inside here so I can look at everything and I try to analyze it fast. Well, being a wolf, you, you have to be able, like, you have to be like that anyway. Plus, you're on a dog. So I had a lot of good, like, natural abilities that, that I used. And eventually, I always wanted to be one of the best connectors, like one of the, you know, I became one of the best. But that was because of my ability to, uh, I, like, to put my whole being, my whole spirit into what I was doing. Guys would say, uh, you know, I'm superhuman. I'm not superhuman. I do 100 push-ups before I go to work, 100, 100 sit-ups, and I said, I go to work with this thing wide open. And, uh, so I, I, I was I working about 25 years. We did a lot of big, big jobs. Like, and uh, like 50 ton picks, 400 ton picks and stuff like that. That was unheard of in that time. But it was like, uh, after a while, I kept on saying to myself, every every, tape, every place they move me, I'm the head one. But I don't have the accreditation of being a pusher or a former or nothing like that. So I got tired of working for uh, Sandy. I got tired of working for the white man and making them money. I decided to go on my own, well, me and my brother. Hawananda, which is Mo, and Kongi Diki, which is Kongi which is Do. We started a company. It was called Sanko. And, but because of like uh, being different, our mindsets are different, our personalities are different. And my brother was already a carver, soap stone carver, so there, were, there wasn't that much work. So my other brother, he went back to work too. He was iron working, so I, I just stayed out there. Knocking on doors. Pretty soon, I went from four guys to eight guys, and I was up to twelve guys. And but I, I was trying to take care of family and guys that weren't really, they weren't trained yet. And I was training them. And I wasn't gonna. I was getting no like you got dollars from great and all that shit. No, but they're still not producing good good men. But after a while, I had to shut that down, pay my bills off, and start back up again. And the next time I went around, I got up to twenty five men. And my payroll wasn't, I didn't have no bank, uh, no credit with the bank line or credit line. I never had nothing, not, not much help from Great or Aboriginal Business Canada. The last time I was in business, we went up to 45 guys. And my payroll was 55000 a week. Again, with no credit line with any bank, no help from any institution down here. We did it. But it comes to the point where I personally lost 300 grand that year because uh, I did a big job at the airport. We were there for a year and a half and... We did another one in Brampton that was like, uh, they were high. The guys that I had working for me couldn't understand that where, where I took them, we were going to get, we were getting high visibility. Because you never seen, there was never ever a uh, Ungohongwe company in the Malton, like in Toronto International Airport. I took Sunrise in there. We were in, uh, we were the only Ungohongwe company going to Hydro One. I went in there to fix up other people's mistakes. And it, it was like, I tried to take these guys and I tried to explain them. I said, if you look after, help me look after this company, I'll look after ourselves. You'll look after us. And I set up a different trust center where somebody passed on. I would honor with it $500 cash and I give them a check from Sunrise. That Sunrise was my money that I was putting to them. And the money, the 500 cash came from the men. But it came from a trust that I set up. Because they didn't understand. They were all young by then. But... To me, that's where we're at right now because you got all this tobacco money coming through here and, and uh, other kind of monies like gas money and all that stuff and there's no trust to set it up in. Look at all the money that HDI has been pulling through. 
if we had a trust set up 40 years ago, even 60 years ago, a commonwealth trust that we could look after each other, this would be very prosperous. You'd have, you'd have like the way you've got here, all the healthy foods. We should be all eating like that. You wouldn't have diabetes. You wouldn't have high blood pressure. You wouldn't have depression. There's a whole bunch of the natural order could put back in our way of life. When that happened at Ganostado, I was already there every night. But when I went to work that next day, my son-in-law, Carl, called me. He says, the cops came in. I said, well, I can turn around, come back. No, we got on her. We're okay. He didn't tell me there was 3,000 people down there. You know, <laughs> so I kept calling back. And I told my boss, my pusher, I said, I might have to leave. And I told him what was going on. He said, you got to go to school. So then I stayed all day. When I got back, that's the first place I went. And uh, I said, holy shit. Can't leave now. So I stayed there. What did you see that first day on, this would have been uh, April 20th, 2006? Mm -hmm. I came in on six line and I, I had to work my way to get into the dam. You know, I didn't believe that how much, uh, to me there's a picture, I mean, I had I had a, a, an agreement with uh, Turtle Island and uh, with, uh, at the time it was Tekka, that my picture would never be in there. I'm standing on a tower where it says Unity. And that, that's the day Augustine was going to pull out. And Ida was going to pull out. And Tiny Nega was going to pull out. Because when I got there that, that morning, I, I'd stay all night and I'd go back to my place, I'd clean up and I'd come back again, probably about 10, 10.30. I tried to sleep for a couple of hours. And I got back down and I'm sitting bullying it. Bullet sister called and said, you got to get back down on site. I said, why? That's where I'm going anyway. She says, Uncle Susty's going to pull out and the night is going to go. So it's tight. And I said, why? He says, because the chiefs and clan mothers want to take the, they want to take the barricades down. I said, it ain't going to happen. So I get down there that time and we were all standing at, they were all on a tower. So I went up on top and I started talking to them. I said, look at you guys. I said, it looks like we're all fighting amongst ourselves right now. I said, and uh, Mike, uh, the other name, Mike Laffin said, well, they're, gonna, they're taking, they're going to take the barricades down. I said, no, we got to decide that. It's the people that put the barricades up, not the chiefs and clan mothers. I said, give me two hours. And I went and I talked to who I went and talked to, but they stayed up. 